We're going to start with the questions that came in after that session, and many people um, listened in and sent questions, and I'm going to start there, and then we can go with questions that are coming in from you now. So the first question is for Maria. Um, it is about, we, so we know that contact investigation is a form of active case finding, and of everyone that you identified in that contact investigation, was everyone eligible for preventive therapy? And if no, what is the criteria for eligibility to begin the preventive therapy? Right, thank you so much, Mercy. Um, so uh, in our program, the protocol was that all the contacts uh, from a TB patient's family were uh, screened for TB disease. Everyone who was diagnosed with TB disease was linked with the TB disease treatment program while all those who, in whom uh, we had ruled out TB, they were all eligible for TB preventive treatment. Okay. Okay, thankful. Thanks, thanks, Maria. And another one for you, I think. So what's going to happen to the TB patients during the pandemic, COVID, especially right now when everything is so focused on that? Right. Um, and that's another very good question. So um, in Pakistan, especially in our TB clinic uh, that we run under in this hospital, we had a three-pronged strategy um, where we did, uh, what we did was that we um, increased the follow-up time. So generally, if the patients were receiving uh, one month of uh, treatment, we increased that to two months so that uh, their uh, contact in the clinic is reduced. We also delivered medicines at home for uh, the higher risk populations, those with the comorbidities, for example, or with the severe disease. Um, and then thirdly, we also had COVID screening going on uh, at uh, right at the entrance of the clinic. So everyone, uh, patients as well as the attendants coming to the clinic were screened for COVID. Anyone found to be a COVID suspect or presumptive was directed towards COVID testing facility where they would be tested. And if they needed to see a doctor, the doctor would visit them at the COVID facility instead of bringing them inside the clinic. As inside the clinic, we have uh, drug-resistant TB patients as well as drug-sensitive TB patients and them being at high risk. Um, uh, we found it better that all the COVID uh, suspects are kept away from the TB clinic. Okay, thank you. Let's see, another one, um, another question that has come in is from Mexico. I understand that you have different protocols that you've used in Pakistan for prophylaxis, for preventive therapy. Um, so I would like a, a clarification, please. We use in Mexico isoniazid 100 milligrams daily for six months. And I would just like to, to know what you used, what regimens you used. Sure. Um, so basically, when we started off in 2016, we only had available. So we were giving azimuthal to contacts of all ages, um, and we were giving it for six months. And we used uh, for the dosing, we used the WHO recommendations. Um, when we had rifapentine available to us, um, somewhere around uh, in the second quarter of 2017, we started giving 3 HP. Um, again, the protocol was that we were giving six months of isoniazid, also known as isoniazid prophylaxis therapy or IPT, to everyone uh, less than two years old. And everyone two years or older, we were giving them 3-HP. And then later on, um, towards the end of 2019 and 2020, when uh, there was uh, recommendations by WHO um, in the CRO guidelines for 1-HP, we started giving 1-HP uh, uh, to the contacts, uh, to a subgroup of contacts. Uh, but we have been following WHO recommendations for dosing. Okay, and I can give I um, our interpreter a chance to, to catch up with that. So it was essentially you were able to, you used isoniazid initially when that was what was available, but then when you were able to get rifapentine, you had the opportunity to use this 12-week regimen and then a one-month regimen. So then I should mention that the papers, the reports from the Pakistan team are going to be sent around, the links will be sent around. So the details that were referred to in the presentation, you can have a look at again. Um, so the next questions are for Amin. 
Um, for the households of drug resistant patients, how did you choose the regimens? How did you choose the dosing that you use? This is, this is a very unusual, you know, uncommon experience. Thank you, Dr. Becerra. So uh, the, the seminal study from this comes from the Micronesia experience from the CDC uh, in the US uh, that used the fluoroquinolone uh, regimen. Uh, they used a three drug regimen. Uh, there are uh, some other studies from South Africa that used a similar regimen uh, and, and that formed the evidence base. Uh, uh, in 2015, an expert panel was convened uh, by the Harvard Medical School Dubai Center, uh, which recommended a fluoroquinolone-based red two drug regimen. Uh, so we followed those uh, guidelines uh, and we used two different regimens initially, uh, fluoroquinolone with uh, etambutol and fluoroquinolone with etionamide. Uh, depending what was available. We found that the ethambutol regimen performed better in terms of less adverse events, so we continued with that later on. The, the dosing was as recommended by the WHO for treatment of uh, either drug-susceptible TB or drug-resistant TB, and uh, as, again, recommended by this expert panel in their report. Thank you. Uh, I, I think you might be on mute. Sorry about that. So thank you. How did you make sure that you were ruling out TB disease before you gave the person's preventive therapy and especially for those household contacts of patients with drug resistant TB? Uh, so uh, in our program, ruling out TB was an essential step because uh, we did not want to undertreat anyone with either one or two drugs when they actually required full treatment. So uh, clinical evaluation with at least a chest X-ray was required uh, to be done on any household contact uh, to progress to, uh, to the next step. Uh, and if the household contact was able to produce sputum, we did a sputum-based uh, expert test to uh, rule out TB disease. So at least a chest X-ray with clinical evaluation and then further testing as deemed medically uh, uh, needed by the team. And all that was done before um, anyone could start the preventive therapy treatment regimen? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. And for Dr. Hamida, how long can, this is a more general question, how long does the protection last of the preventive therapy regimens? Thank you, Mercy, uh, for the question. Um, so the um, studies that have been done in the world, um, the only study that has had the longest term follow-up is the studies conducted by George Comstock and his team, uh, Bethel, they're called Bethel set, set of studies. Um, and they were um, conducted in Alaska in the United States in the 1950s. Um, and at that time, once they gave the preventive treatment, they followed the cohort for up to 19 years and found that those uh, that had taken the uh, preventive treatment did not develop TB disease, um, as opposed to those who, who did not take the preventive treatment and uh, they did develop the TB disease. Um, so, it's about 19 years as it currently stands. Uh, and I think those are the only long-term um, studies that have been conducted thus far in the world. Okay, thank you. And then how many times can someone living in a, a zone that has high risk of tuberculosis, how many times can a person receive preventive therapy? Um, at this time, WHO recommends only once. Um, in addition to WHO, when we were conducting our program, because Pakistan is also a high burden country, this was a question that we uh, conferred with uh, multiple different um, experts around the world and those that had conducted clinical trials. And in everyone's opinion, we should, uh, uh, you know, all said that we should do it only once. So once you have given the preventive treatment, uh, let it be. If they develop TB disease after that, just do the follow-up and treat them for the disease. Okay. 
Thank you. And another one related to the treatment. So, and we use preventive treatment, treatment of TB infection. They're the same that we're, we mean the same. Um, what is the likelihood of resistance developing if you give preventive therapy? And does, does this affect the treatment if the person develops TB disease? Um, so there have been um, multiple studies uh, that have been conducted, um, primarily uh, based on isoniazid uh, preventive treatment. Um, and on these studies, there have been a couple of uh, systematic reviews. So um, there is the recent most systematic review is Bell cells uh, emerging infectious disease in 2006. Um, and then there's another one in uh, perhaps in 2000 uh, also. So those two uh, systematic reviews uh, reviewed about 13 studies that have been conducted to look at the resistance patterns. And uh, none of them found uh, any significantly, uh, statistically significant resistance development after preventive treatment had been taken. Um, so, uh, and, and they looked at the relative risks as well as other statistics as well. So none, none of those um, people who had received preventive treatment showed any resistance uh, to uh, TB drugs. Wonderful, okay, thank you. And another one for Dr. Hamida is, what is the cost of providing treatment? What are the important things to consider in that, in the costs? So um, I think when we talk about preventive treatment, we all focus a lot on the cost of the drugs, particularly with the uh, drug sensitive uh, shorter regimens and, and rifapentine coming on the scene. And we talk about how expensive this rifapentine is. Um, I think what we tend to forget is there is cost to deliver these drugs, and that is more significant than actually the drug cost itself. In our uh, studies uh, that we conducted comparing um, INH uh, preventive treatment uh, to 3HP preventive treatment, what we found is that uh, the cost of the human resource that is available at the clinic, um, where we um, do contact evaluation and exclude TB disease, and then uh, start initiate the preventive treatment and then follow up these patients is significantly higher than actually the cost of the uh, drug itself. Um, and within our paper, what we found is because of the shorter duration of 3HP, uh, the cost of three, delivering 3HP was significantly lower than delivering INH, which is for six months. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a question coming in live, and this one's about x-rays and the, the reading, you know, the artificial intelligence reading. So could you tell me if the x-rays that were assessed using the artificial intelligence readings were all also reviewed systematically by a radiologist? And if not, which x-rays were reviewed, if any, by a radiologist? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. Um, I can take that. Um, so um, I think when the, um, um, our, our program focused on using uh, CAT for TB um, uh, to rule out uh, TB disease in terms of the x-rays, in the initial years when we got the CAT for TB, we did compare every single x-ray um, with a radiology read as well. But as we became more comfortable with using CAT for TB, then um, you know, we switched over primarily to CAT4 TB and only in cases of um, a very um, a difficult read x-rays or if it's a very, um, you know, coming up to be really borderline uh, figures, then only we would uh, consult a radiologist. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and here's a, a question coming in from Peru. Um, could one of you, perhaps it, it's for Maria, um, could one of you please talk about the experience of using this treatment in adults? So preventive therapy in the adult contacts, because it isn't something that we're doing in many places. Right. And maybe you. the question is how, to, yeah. What, what can you tell us about that right. experience? So um, in Pakistan, this was, uh, this was the first experience uh, to give uh, preventive treatment to adults. 
um, we did face some challenges. The basic challenge was that most of the contracts that come in for evaluation have no symptoms. They are not sick, they're not unwell. So um, it was very difficult to convince them to come to the facility in the first place uh, for clinical evaluation and ruling out TB disease. Um, and then the next part was initially when we were giving six months of finish, it was really difficult because telling a healthy person to take medicine for six months um, on a daily basis, it's really difficult, um, uh, which is why we saw uh, lower treatment completion rates. But when we had 3HP, uh, things became much easier for us because people were relatively willing to take uh, um, take medicine once a week and that only for 12 weeks. So it was difficult, but with uh, with trained counselors uh, working for us in the program um, and doctors also helping in the cause, um, we did, I think we did a fine job. So the shorter regimen was uh, very helpful both for people receiving the treatment, the adults receiving the treatment and the program to deliver a much shorter regimen. Yes, in that and it case. was actually also, um, it was also comparatively easier for um, children because uh, the parents and the guardians are responsible for giving treatment and remembering to do that only once a week is easier instead of doing that every day. Okay, and so then we the saw follow up there. I'm sorry, say that again. Um, so, uh, which is why we saw better completion rates with uh, shorter uh, treatment regimens. And did you have trouble, I know this is probably what the colleague is asking, did you have difficulty having people accept, the adults accept the preventive treatment because it was a new experience, this hadn't been offered before? Yes, so um, it was uh, it was difficult to convince them, like I said, but when we, uh, the strategies that were used by the counselors was um, to tell them about the, uh, the risk and the benefit uh, comparison. And um, they had seen people suffering in their family. So TB patients, they go through a lot. Um, there's weakness and, you know, uh, people even lose their jobs. So when you try to convince them that if you take preventive treatment, um, you will be able to avoid the disease and all that follows with it. It was, it was completely easier to convince them. And the shorter uh, treatment um, and reduced number of follow-ups was also a benefit and also reduced adverse events associated. So the counseling is a critical part of, the, of this program. Yes, for the, our program, it was, yes, yes. That was one of the key um, elements in our program. Okay, thank you. And one more, another question about also x-ray. So I'll just read it because I haven't digested it. That, did all patients with an abnormal x-ray on the CAD see a clinician or did they have a sample taken and sent for testing and then only see a clinician once a positive gene expert result was received? For those with a negative expert result, was there any follow-up of the abnormal x-ray? So I guess this is about the algorithm. How did you deal with the X-ray and the gene expert algorithm? Um, I'll I'll take that. Um, yes, we um, anybody with an abnormal CAD uh, saw a physician, as well as get a, a sputum uh, test for gene expert. So it was it was part of the algorithm that as soon as it's an abnormal X-ray, you will have to see a physician as well as uh, see um, the um, uh, see, uh, get the gene expert done. Um, for those that had normal CAD, uh, but you know there were still any symptoms, we would even have those people see a physician as well, and um, they um, they were then evaluated um, further if if required by the doctor, if the doctor so thought. Mercy, you're mute. Thanks. So the people with negative expert results also had follow-up yes. as part of a clinical, a complete evaluation. A complete clinical uh, uh, yeah, evaluation process, yes. Okay. Everybody was seen by a physician. Okay, great. Um, and and may I, sorry, may I, may I add that that was in particular when we were in a clinic setting uh, if we are in a camp setting or in a mobile x-ray setting, the things may, may differ because then it would depend if there's a doctor present or not. 
but this in the case of the contacts who were all being evaluated in the clinic. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So the next question is in two parts and it's uh, kind of about the program. So first, before I ask this question, I want to remind or ask uh, Maria to remind us how many people received both the 3HP and the 1HP because these are big numbers. So first, just remind us. <laughs> Can you hear me? I think um, we might have lost Maria, or if Amin or Hamida can can mention, because it's several thousand. Right. So we had um, uh, approximately fifteen thousand contacts who received three uh, HP and one HP. So it may be my. I'm sorry. It may be my um, internet. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So in those thousands of people who were, went yes. through this program, the question then is how, um, how just to re, you know, clarify or get this more detail on this, how was the assessment of the contacts done? Was it done at a medical facility? Was it done at home? Maybe it both, um, how, how was the assessment of the contacts completed, the evaluation? Sorry. So uh, what we did was that as soon as the TB patient was, reg uh, was registered, um, we would enumerate all the contacts present in the family. Um, after enumeration, everyone was screened verbally for TB symptoms, and they were all invited into the health facility for clinician evaluation. Uh, one of the important um, uh, parts of the process was a mandatory chest x-ray for all contacts, all ages. Um, after the chest x-ray um, and the symptoms, all those who had either symptoms or um, a presumptive chest x-ray would um, be asked to submit a sputum sample. And um, all those who were able to produce sputum sample, we would run gene expert on that. And those who were not able to produce sample, um, sample or no sample would uh, see a physician. Uh, where they would assess their symptoms, their other medical history, and the x-rays. And based on that, they would decide whether they have TB disease or they don't. And when uh, the samples were submitted for sputum examination, we would wait for the results. And um, these contacts would be evaluated after uh, they had their labs come in. And okay. in all those that were diagnosed with TB, they would be linked to the TB disease treatment. Okay, and so most of that then required. Um, I hope. The... Go ahead. Please come in. No, no, sorry. So most of that required um, the persons to come to, at least for the x ray and the medical exam, definitely had to be the clinical exam, definitely had to come to a facility, to the main facility for those procedures. Sorry, can you hear me? You can, okay. I'm, yes. I'm losing Maria so, then. Um, okay. Yes, so um, I would like to share one of the learnings from our program was that um, we initially had everyone coming into the facility, but we also had a simultaneous. Um, I can hear you all right, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Go on, we can hear you now. I think we were delayed. Okay, sorry. Um, so basically, uh, when we started off, we were asking all the contacts to visit a health facility, but fortunately, we also had a simultaneous act, um, simultaneously running active case finding program uh, where we were screening all adults and children in health facilities as well as the communities. So um, when we were facing problems, uh, trying to have uh, contacts visit the health facility, we started running our uh, community camps where we, would, um, where we would have a mobile x-ray van um, along with the clinician and counselor visit the community, um, basically places near where we had most of the contacts coming in. Um, that way they didn't have to visit the facility at odd hours and wait um, and have long waiting hours um, at the health facility. 
So we would uh, run x-rays for all of them. We would also collect sputum on site. Um, everyone was seen by a clinician, evaluated, and in those that had no symptoms and um, their x-rays were also clean and they had no other comorbidities for which they need, uh, they need to be tested, they would start preventive treatment then and there. Uh, while others, uh, which was a very, very small number, would be referred to the health facility for further evaluation and uh, consultation with the, the physicians. And that, um, that uh, significantly improved our evaluation numbers. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I think that's it. in terms of the live questions, I think we've addressed them. Are there any, let's see, any others that Oh, yes, I had one that we had also received about 1HP or the, or the short regimens. Were there differences, Maria, in how the field implementation for the daily, one month daily regimen, which is the 1HP, compared to your 12 week weekly regimen, the 3HP? What was your experience with those two? All right. Um, so, um... Our experience with both of them was uh, really good, but when HP uh, made things further easier for us, um, it was easier to convince the contacts to take the treatment. It was one month. Um, and uh, um, we saw better completion rates. Consent was easier. There was, uh, there was uh, they were essentially just two follow-ups. So people would take their treatment for two weeks and then they would come back and take the treatment for another two weeks. Uh, while with 3HP, it did have comparably more number of follow-ups. Um, so completion rates with 1HP were significantly better. We had um, more than 90% contacts completing uh, 1HP, while 3HP, we had completion rates of uh, about more than 70%. So yeah, the shorter the treatment regimen, um, the completion rates uh, significantly improved. We did see that. Wow. Um, thank you. Let's see. There's another one. Was there any stigma associated with going to the mobile x-ray truck? Or where were you able to put the truck? Did some people not want the TV screening near them or near their home? Um, that's actually a pretty good question. So yes, in Pakistan, we still have a stigma associated with the disease. So uh, what we would do is that we would not go exactly to the uh, to a street where we had more contacts, we would go to a nearby place. And these uh, community camps were not just contact screening camps. So we would also announce uh, for regular um, uh, regular population to come in for free x-rays uh, as part of the TB screening. So it didn't, um, it didn't um, focus on just the contacts. We had contacts as well as the regular uh, public uh, being asked to come in as part of the uh, community screening program. So that's a really important learning also that you had this issue. Um, in during the webinar, if you all go back to listen to it ever, I hope you will. Um, uh, Hamida described also kind of the, the complementary component of this, of the preventive therapy program was this large active case finding intervention. And I wonder if Hamida, maybe you can just say a couple of words about that, because it sounds like having that in place at the same time as the preventive therapy program was really fruitful for several reasons. Yes, absolutely. So um, um, I think WHO um, has done some modeling studies earlier. Um, I think it was in 2003, if I remember Chris Dye's paper, which has actually shown that the only way to make a dent on TB incidence to the level that you know we can achieve an elimination is uh, when you have active case finding and preventive treatment running side by side and complementing each other. So that is what was initiated in Pakistan. Um, and we had um, uh, both the arms of these um, programs running simultaneously. So um, if there was a, per and we also worked very hard to destigmatize uh, the TB disease per se uh, through awareness campaigns that were run as part of the program. So both in terms of television ads and in terms of billboards, uh, use of celebrity to kind of, you know, making TB as normal as possible and having the same connotation as a diabetes or a hypertension uh, disease rather than in infectious disease. Um, so 
using all these strategies simultaneously worked and then we were able to kind of you know convince the community to come out when a mobile x-ray van uh, was parked in that community um, in addition to these um, larger campaigns i think before a mobile mobile uh, camp was initiated um, our teams did go to um, in that community and talk to the community elders um, to kind of help prepare the ground. Um, they also went to mosques to announce for, with Friday prayers or um, other prayer times that a, um, a free camp will be initiated to, to look at respiratory diseases. And then rather than doing TB screening, we, we referred to it as respiratory diseases. So, um, and the doctor was available um, over there to kind of, you know, take care of any other um, illness that might be identified also. So um, I think uh, there were various ways where the teams worked hand in hand to destigmatize uh, the TB disease. And further, it was the, when the vans were nearby, it made it easier for this preventive therapy program to right. have the access to the x-rays. So that's just a huge step to be able to per, uh, eliminate the need for persons to go all the way to a health facility to get their x-ray because x-ray is a critical part of this ruling out. If you bring the x-ray closer to the contacts, they will be more likely to finish that step for evaluation. So that's absolutely, absolutely bang on. So we have a related question about the mobile air x-ray truck. So was the, were the trucks able to access areas of dense population, like high density areas, uh, or was it too big to get through? And maybe you can say more how many trucks were, you know, eventually running, et cetera. So I think in total in Pakistan under this program, we had 55 x-ray vans. Uh, and yes, the x-ray <laughs> vans were large. So um, they, it was, um, um, it, it did uh, go into the dense areas. Our, I think our working zone um, uh, in Karachi, Karachi is a city with a population of 22 million. So really, and it's really densely populated city and some areas more so than the others. Uh, but regardless, um, of the densely populated areas, I think the vans were able to access all of them. And it, it wasn't a necessity to take the van into the smallest possible lane in that area. It, could, it was parked at a relatively um, known space, perhaps a mosque, perhaps a school, perhaps something else where the van had space to be parked and uh, people had space to gather. Uh, when we did not have COVID. So people could actually gather together and, and you know, we can do a quick throughput uh, with the x-rays. Um, and I think that, that's how we, we approached most camps. Uh, Maria, please add if, if I'm missing anything. Um, thank you, Dr. Amida. Um, so uh, some areas are difficult to reach, but then uh, we were always able to find, uh, with the help of the community elders and the other community members, a suitable place uh, where it was easier for the communities uh, and people to reach the extra truck without having to travel long distances. Um, and I think we, we did a pretty fine job and people were, were happy with the work we did. Very much. And uh, one question about uh, the drug-resistant preventive therapy program that I think is best phrased as what is the kind of when you were first working on getting this started, what were some of the challenges around um, preventive therapy for resistant, you know, people exposed at home to resistant strains? Uh, I, I can start and then if uh, I oh, understand. And let me add that. And what was kind of the background, the reason that you kind of started? That had you seen a lot of TB in those families before? So giving a bit of that. It's okay. So I'll, I'll take the second part first. So the, the reason why we uh, went for the program was because we saw uh, recurring cases of DRTB in the same families and same households. Uh, so multiple patients from the same household would present uh, to the program with drug-resistant TB, uh, showing that there might uh, there was a tran a household transmission going on that needed to be broken. Okay, uh, that led to the overall uh, uh, idea of uh, of this program uh, that we did. Uh, 
when we were starting out, uh, because this was really novel with very few studies published and no guidelines around it, especially no WHO or uh, any international society guidelines as such, uh, we needed to do a lot of stakeholder engagement and a lot of advocacy to actually get people on board, especially the clinicians and the, the policymakers. Uh, we started it out as a research study, so it was under the umbrella of an institutional review board uh, as well. Uh, which uh, provided uh, which provided more confidence to people because it was being conducted uh, under oversight. Uh, and then as the program rolled out and as we started giving uh, treatment to the household contacts and uh, contacts did not develop any uh, serious adverse events along the way, uh, there was more... Uh, acceptance of the program as it was built up. Thank you. Um, and how about any uh, any other lessons that we haven't? I don't know if, uh, Liberty, if you have any other questions, I don't see any more. Um, are there any other learnings or lessons that any of you would like to share that we haven't touched on? Or maybe emphasizing something from the, the webinar, which, I, I'll remind everyone that we will send around some links to the various, you know, the colleagues presented their experience and there were a lot of references on the slides and as many of those as we can link to um, those papers and reports we will send out to all of you who have participated um, so you can have access to those that information. So one, one important component that was really important for DRTB, but equally important for DSTB was the counseling aspect that we had built in to our programs because uh, we needed to emphasize the risks and uh, the benefits of the preventive treatment. And this needed to be done at each step and uh, multiple times, like there was a counseling component during follow-ups as well. Uh, to encourage people to complete treatment. And that really helped uh, the program and the treatment completion rates uh, that we saw. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions that have come in, Liberty, perhaps that I'm not seeing? Or anything there are else? no questions left in the chat, and it looks like you've answered all of those by in the Q&A function. Great. So I guess this would be a final call to our audience. If anyone final else call. has a question. But we really appreciate everyone who is connected. And for this inaugural session, I think it's so clear that there's so many questions that we can learn about together from different experiences. So we really appreciate the connection, and we're going to make sure that we keep these conversations going and hear from Peru and Mexico and many other uh, teams. So I think that that's it. If any of the colleagues have any additional comments before we say thank you. All right, so thank you everyone. Um, and we really appreciate you being here and we will see you hopefully next month and you'll be hearing about the next sessions please tell everyone that you know thank you very much and thank you to our panelists we really appreciate you and all your work and your team thank you thank you so much thank, thank you, you very you much Amina. and thank you to our to our interpreter mm -hmm. invaluable Are we good? Okay. Are we still live or? <laughs> okay. We're still live. Okay. Oh, you're waiting for them. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day. Have a great day.
the Liberty, how many people did we have? Can you tell? Um, just around 35 in total. Wonderful.